everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about configuration and uh, deeper the meaning behind it. So let's roll. Let's uh, flip to the slides and start. Have we had the slides yet or we're it still at me? Just want to make sure. Okay, one second. Is that better? Oh, many me, great. All right, let's focus on one me for now. And um, let's start. So the next 40 minutes I'll, you know, I'll uh, we'll be talking about configuration and I'll try to focus on bringing some love to it. Um, so let's start uh, with the question, what is configuration? Um, before I wanna make sure that, you, do you guys see my slides? Because if I go full screen, I don't see the, the comments. Great, thanks. Okay, so what is configuration? Uh, since, you know, since I can choose any definition I want, I uh, went to the dictionary and the definition that I like, at least for this talk, comes from physics or chemistry and uh, it's also called confirmation and it's the shape of a molecule as determined by the arrangement of its atoms, right? And uh, so we can derive many different conclusions from this definition, which is, which is great. So for example, let's look at this configuration, right? So this is a well-known configuration. This is a molecule and it's, uh, depending on its configuration, uh, a lot of things change, right? So it's actually amazing that uh, depending on uh, this configuration, somebody is left-handed, somebody is right-handed, somebody is more creative, less creative, more mathematically inclined and so forth. So I just wanna give you this uh, feel from the, from the get-go that uh, you know, configuration is something more than just the port number. Um, and uh, I want to jump into the simulation simulation argument and uh, uh, simulation argument if is uh, this uh, trilemma that was proposed by Nick, was proposed by Nick Bostrom and uh, he he's he's a prominent philosopher and he says that one of these three bullet points that you see is most likely is almost certainly to be true so we either get to the this post human stage where we uh, we uh, we, sorry, we're never going to get to this uh, post-human st stage. We're going to get extinct before that, where, uh, at, at which we will, will be able to run any kind of simulations, any kind of high fidelity simulations. Or we'll get to that stage, but uh, we're not going to run them because uh, we're either not going to run to a significant number of them or we're just not going to be interested in running them. Or we almost certainly live in a computer simulation, or at least portion, po 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 part of humanity lives in, in a computer simulation. Some, some of them, so some of you guys are familiar with this, but uh, what I want to go from this, what I can get from this, is to say we need to, you know, simulate the reality. Let's say we get to that post-human stage and we need to simulate the reality. And let's say we want to simulate the universe, the whole universe of the year 1984 or multiples of universes. And it'll, it'll need to be configured, right? So let that sink in for a minute. So it's not, it's not a web app with three pages where, with a port number and uh, you know, and some database connection. It's actually, you have to configure the whole universe um, and you have to make sure that this high fidelity simulation, the, so people, when people live in that simulation, they actually live in the simulation that they believe in. Um, and yet, you know, when we're talking about configuration today is, uh, you know, it's port numbers, host names and some versions. So let's make it flat, you know, key value and strings only, right? I think with the, you know, with the, a deeper meaning behind configuration with, with closure and with uh, rich data structures and the love for data, we can do a lot better than this. So first let's uh, talk about 12 factor config, uh, which is uh, a well-known 12 factor episode, well-known best practices and uh, a lot of people follow it. Um, so, and there's a config section in 12 factor, which says, you know, how you, your, your application should be configured and what's, what are the best, what are the best practices for that? So first, uh, 12 factor config says that uh, the app stores config and environment variables, right? So that's uh, that's the mantra. 
And so let's let's go back to this uh, world simulation. Let's say we need to simulate it in different environments. Like we need to simulate 194 uh, on Earth. We need to simulate it on Mars. Let's say humans live on Mars instead of Earth. And uh, say we need to simulate it in the Horsehead Nebula. All right. Uh, it would be quite quite daunting to try to configure everything with environment variables. At least quite daunting for me. So your mileage may vary, but I would rather prefer something more you know, rich and more data-driven. Uh, so another thing with environment, environment variables, for example, we can't ignore, you know, the popularity of uh, containerization and uh, Docker and environment variables, uh, you know, do not have very good security story because they're not well, well isolated between the containers. For example, in, in, in terms of, in, in case of Docker, you can, you know, you can do Docker inspect and see all the environment variables so all your secrets are out. Uh, different containers uh, can leak environment variables into other containers and so forth. So just something to keep in mind. Um, so, but there's also some good parts of 12-factor config. For example, you know, it's, it says that you shouldn't keep creds in sources, right? So one, one of the litmus tests that they have is if at any point your application becomes open sourced, uh, you shouldn't uh, compromise any credentials, right? It's a good, good, good thing to keep in mind. Uh, when you you know when you check in in your sources, another good thing is uh, you know don't create profile or anywhere configs. Um, so basically, some libraries or you know many different projects that I've seen you, you people try to stick a lot of uh, if then in config. So if I run in production, I use this one. If I run in QA, I use this one. If I run in dev, I use this URL and so forth. In the same configuration file. So configuration file to to in my opinion should be completely environment transparent right so just should just just have uh, you know non environment properties and all the environment properties will be over overridden or added later so another good part is don't create multiple configs with different profiles environments is because uh, you know this is this uh, results in combinatorial explosion as 12 configs 12 factor configs put it and uh, it's it's really it's really true if you work with you know, teams more than three or four people, you could get to, or with different teams like QA team or production team or staging team, you get to quickly realize that uh, anybody, everybody likes their own, their own environment and their, their own files and it gets very messy. Um, so before I jump in, let me see if I have, okay, so we're good. No, oh no, oh, I saw something. Uh, link to slides, I'll, I'll, I'll post the link to slides. Uh, I don't know if I can post it here. Let's see. Boom. Okay. Um, so let's go back to slides. All right. So this is a quick, uh, you know, just a quick go through where do we usually keep our configuration, right? So we either keep it in local files. Some people keep something, so system properties, environment variables, remote tools like Zookeeper console and so forth. Uh, we keep encrypted stuff in databases and key stores in Vault, which, is, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. And, uh, you know, sometimes people keep configs in the databases. For example, imagine that 1984 configs, that there's a lot of them and it's pretty, it's pretty rich. So, and uh, we'll, you know, jump into this point right, right away. So configs is, becomes less of, uh, you know, key value things, which, uh, you know, which people usually don't care much about, but it actually becomes data. All right. And that's, uh, Interesting because uh, when you think about config as data, it comes becomes a lot closer to to your code and a lot closer to the processes and you know things that you do. It becomes kind of integ integral part of uh, your design. And anywhere, of course, from port forty two, you know, to the whole virtual world world simulation, uh, when you configure it, you know, it's uh, uh, as, uh, the the richer your model, uh, the more uh, you know, the more the, the richer your configuration should be. <clears throat> I guess at, at least uh, your configuration approach should allow for richer configuration, right? Um, so, for example, if the model of the universe is hierarchical, you know, which your configuration should be hierarchical as well, and uh, key value might not even might, might not start, might not get to the points where you want to override things or reconfigure things. You're going to have to use different tools for different overrides, which is kind of strange. So data, data is just simple. Another thing is, uh, you know, in computer science, we know that uh, we have data structures to efficiently manage and uh, work with data. So if if you agree with me that configuration should be data and is data, then why not 
having data structure to um, to host the data, to have the data, and to work with uh, the data, to organize the data. And uh, one of the points I want to make is uh, one, when we start to do data structures for configuration, so data structures for descriptions of metadata or anything, we tend to introduce a lot of uh, our things, right, or business things, or you know, not not exactly data uh, supported, na native native data supported by language by the language things. So we would like to wrap something up and reuse it and uh, wrap something in within the configuration or within the data. So I I, I would say that uh, you know I found it rather limiting when you would do that. It, it it seems like a good idea at first because it's cleaner it's more usable it's more readable but it's it's it ends up to be more readable to you and more cleaner to you and it's very subjective so i'd rather at least at least uh, to start with start with just data and if you really you really need to you can add some sprinkle some dsl around it but uh not to do that a lot will allow you to, will open your data will open your configuration to a lot more you know people tools validations and so forth and we'll go over this a little bit um so for example, if your configuration is just data structure or just closure data structure, it can be easily overridden with closure APIs. It's just simple, right? There's a, I don't think you can argue with this because closure collections API is great. Uh, it can be, it's also easily portable, right? Because now you can use any of the tools that just would work with just data structures like transit protobuf, JSON, message pack, anything, right? Or any standard li library. So for example, in this, uh, in this example, We'll pretend that this is our this is our configuration, uh, which is a little snippet, of course. But uh, in, in this example, I use transit uh, to convert it to, to, to byte stream. You can send it anywhere. Anybody understands byte stream, even network, which is great. Uh, so uh, then I'll, I'll I'm just converting it back from the byte stream back to configuration, and see everything everything stayed the same. Right. One interesting bit here is I included a function in the configuration, which I which I will talk about a little, a little later. Uh, and uh, this is something that's uh, that allows configuration to be not just you know a description of something, but allows it to be also functional, which is great. And I'll I'll uh, talk about it a little later, but just something to note. Um, of course, uh, configuration should be queryable, right? Uh, with closure specter or any tools that we have. Um, of course, closure is the first one. To try if you have something simple like this for example you know when we need to answer a question which server port our uh you know our application is listening what do we do first we go to netstat you know grab listen whatever we'll try to hunt for the pit for our application and see what port we're listening on but we don't have to do that if we have you know if our configuration is just data structure we can expose you know certain apis and certain endpoints if you will or whatever the it doesn't have to be a web application, for example, but you can usually you can easily use uh, closure built-in tools, right? So here, you, one liner will tell you what port it listens to exactly. You're not going to miss the PID. You're not going to miss the connection established, connection waiting, or whatever the, those things that start gives you. Uh, again, so this is a little contrived example, but you can you know answer the question: What data stores are we connected to currently, or we or are we supposed to be connecting to? Right. So the, here we're using Specter. Um, just to you know, get those uh, get those URLs from the configuration, which is which is pretty handy. We can answer we can answer more interesting questions like uh, you know, give me all the ports that my application is, is bound to, and uh, of course, Spectre Spectre is really great at you know querying anything, really. So here we we just uh, you know just simply gives you three ports, which is great. Uh, so yeah, it, it, the, the the main point is uh, if, if it's a data structure, it's queryable and it's great. Configuration is just data, and it should be introspectable and queryable. Uh, of course, validation. We just uh, went through the first uh, part of the spec workshop, which is great and uh, kind of should resonate with this. So if you if uh, configuration is just data structure, we can easily validate it um, with with spec uh, with any other tools, of course, uh, that you you may like. If we introduce some kind of DSL into it or something else that becomes a little bit problematic, you can still find your way around it because spec is really powerful. But uh, just the idea that you know, just configuration is just key values, and and uh, uh, it's just a little limiting to, to 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 my liking. So again, if it's a data structure, if it's just a data structure without any other you know DSL-ish kind of things, then it's it just it becomes easy to validate. 
and it happened to me many times you know i'm sure it happened to you guys as well when you, you know, pass your application from one environment to another depending on teams or people who work in that environment they'll misspell it they'll it's forgot to forget to add something to configuration and it's always great to have you know as a first part of uh, your startup or is some script to just validate your configuration before before they raise any problems because it's just usually just a simple misspells and some simple errors that quickly fixable but again validation is important um, so this is a minor point hold a lot of text <laughs> if you have uh, you know if you'd like to expose your configuration uh, sometimes uh, sometimes depending on where uh, what, what the project is and what, what, what we're doing what the application is you can even exp expose all the configuration that you have just a, just a handy thing to have you know, to look at configuration of the application but you don't want to see certain things like uh, in this case auth token or the don't expose me thing or the password or something like that of course you shouldn't keep passwords here to, to begin with but if it's a data structure you can easily clog that i mean i'm using cprop which i'm going to talk a little later but uh, you can easily use uh, you know closure closure to liner to to just uh, you know just cloak things that you don't want to people to see it's just uh, yet another point that if it's a data structure then it's it becomes a lot easier to reason about and to work with uh and to you know massage it in any way that you want or need um so before i go here let me check um okay i'm just trying to see if there are any uh, okay, so it seems like we're good. I was just, just looking at the questions if we had any. Um, so this is a good point. So this is uh, something that I mentioned before. We had a function in our configuration. Uh, so I, I believe that configuration should allow us to be functional, right? We should allow configuration to be functional depending on the, you know, on the project environment and so forth. But uh, let's uh, look at this uh, statement by Lua, right? Lua used in in in, in a lot of in in a lot, a, a lot of fields, right? And uh, one prominent, most prominent field, I guess, uh, is gaming development. There's a lot of low configuration goes in games. Kind of resonates with the simulation, with the world simulation that we wanted to do before. Uh, so, and, and it says that the great strength of Lua is that configuration file can define functions to be called by the application. And of course, the enterprise reaction that we usually have, you know, C sharp, Java, and all the other shops, is no, no, no. It's a huge security risk. I don't want to even hear about it. Right, but it doesn't have to be security. For example, in Lua, right, you can create uh, some that's called sandbox, uh, sandboxes, and you can actually define functions. That, the only function that you allow that you allow to be invoked, right, from this within the sandbox. And then later, you can see that we, you know, we have some untrusted code that we want to run, and uh, we load that untrusted code, and we're passing this environment along with that code as, as we load it. And of course, if it you know if it tries to call some other function or tries to misbehave, we'll just uh, throw and we're not gonna run it. Uh, so that p call at the end will just either throw or run it. So that's that's what it means. But the the, the whole idea is uh, you can specify your own environment, your own sandbox, and uh, you shouldn't worry about it. Another, so for example, uh, going back to um, you know to the back of to the back of example. So here we would uh, we have a back of uh, strategy right and if you look at the function the function the function actually makes it makes this back off to be exponential every time you come back you know you you multiply milliseconds by two and then exponentially exponentially grows until you know until uh, what, what is it two minutes one 120,000 milliseconds but you can change that you can make this back off constant right you can uh, you can do whatever you want so it, and it, it gives you it gives you a good uh, you know, good leverage it gives you a lot of power to work with your configuration of course you know certain certain environment environment certain functions uh, certain certain uh, languages certain projects you know management will not allow you to do that but i think uh, the configuration approach should allow to be functional right it actually allows allows you to be a lot more flex flexible uh one of the you know one of the examples of where you know where it's okay and i don't see any security risk with it i mean there are always security risks with everything but i i don't see i see little security risk with the uh, like boot for boot versus line again right so in boot and you can call it a, your build configuration in a way right it configures your, your build infrastructure but it's completely programmable there's some data but it's mostly functions mostly tasks and functions and it's beautiful right it, it, it's, it empowers you to do a lot of things um 
so another, another point is of course configuration you know needs to be versioned so sometimes we will leave off those files and uh, those environment specific things uh, to live somewhere else and uh, they get lost on boxes or on hard drives fail you know it's on that laptop but not, not on this laptop and if we agree that configuration is data and we know that code is data at least in closure then uh, you know as, if we version code why don't we version configuration should should be no different of course different types of configuration should be versioned a little differently so for example uh, you have core configuration which can live within the source code because it shouldn't expose shouldn't, shouldn't have any creds shouldn't have any environment specific um, information but other overrides and notice not just not other configuration files but other overrides like uh, your environment of specific overrides should be also version they can live in different repository they can uh, you know they can live uh, they can, they can be versioned somehow, some, 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 somewhat in, in, in a different fashion, you know, uh, but they also should be versioned. So it's easy to, you know, to pull back and reproduce. It's easy to work with, across teams and so forth. Production override should uh, live outside of, outside of source code, of course, but should also be versioned. And uh, there's this uh, thing called Git, Git to console, which is interesting. It's, you have uh, your, all your overrides in Git and uh, Git to console will watch any changes and git that you make and uh, we'll update console with it. Console is like a zookeeper like thing. So all your, it's a distributed, distributed configuration uh, manager. So all your application will see the change right away. So just another point of uh, version in your config. Uh, of course, configuration should have, you know, comments, right? Because we have a lot of, we don't see it a lot in Clojure, but uh, in JavaScript, for example, in JavaScript world, there's a lot of configuration that's done in JSON. And uh, it, just imagine, you know, your operating system configuration, like your Etsy, Etsy directory or anything, your Linux configuration files or MySQL configuration, having no comments. I mean, this is this is not something you want to work with. Uh, I mean, you you I would rather prefer to see a lot of comments, as as for example, our operating system configs have they have a lot of comments, and uh, it's it's good to have comments in configuration. Good to have a, a capability to leave comments to have comments. And of course, closure data structures and it just uh, you know, but the reader it allows it to have comments, which is great. Uh, we want uh, you know, I want uh, a, a, an ability for uh, you know the configuration approach to work in a way that I where I can uh, change configuration on the fly. And I know it, with uh, you know with all the mutability, mutability uh, dilemma and closure, this is this sounds like a strange thing to do because you know we don't mutate stuff, we don't change stuff in in production. We either restart the whole system or not nothing, so it's all, all nothing approach. But, uh, you know, bending our mind a little off of the uh, off of the closure universe there, you know, the universe is a lot bigger. So for this is, for example, an Nginx, uh, which rather, which hosts like top 10,000 world, world websites. So they, they should know what they're doing, right? So, the, so for example, they update their configuration on the fly. You can update the configuration on the fly and the way Nginx works, it, doesn't lose any requests, but it, it just uh, keeps old workers, all, old worker threads to work with old configuration until they're done, until this, the, the time span of the thread of that request is done. And all the new workers are created with new configuration. Which is something, and uh, I'll show it in my, in my demo at the end too. Not not with Nginx, but a similar similar kind of idea. So uh, changing changes over time uh, or, and uh, I specifically didn't say change change at runtime because you know changing something over time seems to be okay in closure. So it's just wording semantics. Uh, we need some kind of coordination, of course, and I'll show you that as well. Uh, in this case, you can see Zookeeper console at CD. So the idea is that you have uh, your configuration should be always available for for your application, right? So for example, you run you know tw uh, twenty. Um, application nodes or 20 application instances and they all they all need to be synced and consistent with configuration so you have configuration live in zookeeper or in console and uh, it also has a, it also has a, has a cluster of its own like three four five three five seven you know 30 nodes where it's all well replicated and available to you and of course security i'll touch on vault a little bit uh, it needs to be secure so you're since we said that we we do not keep creds uh, and secrets in the configuration. So where do we keep them then? We can keep them in files and open text. We might keep them in databases and encrypted stores and key stores, but I find Vault to be much better suited for that because it has a lot of different uh, models and ways to get stuff in and get stuff out, as well as uh, you know different backends that Vault has where, where that, that encrypted things are gonna live. 
So first, before I jump into here, before I jump into demo, um, let's see. Sounds like we're good. Okay, so are we good still? You guys follow me? Am I too fast, babbling too fast, or okay? I'll take it as a yes. Okay, now I'll definitely take it as a yes. Okay, I'm going back because I just I don't see the screen on the right when I when I'm full. Okay, so great, thanks. So I'm going back to the full screen. So first, we, let's see what we're going to really build. I mean, it's already built, but what we're going to look at. Uh, so we're going to look at the Hubble telescope, right, which is in the middle where it says internal config. We're just looking at this from the only from the configuration perspective, of course. So we're going to have a, a Hubble internal config, which is, of course, not environment specific, doesn't have any secrets inside, and uh, it just has its own, you know, its own Hubble related stuff. And then we have our overrides that will live in the console. Uh, we'll have um, Vault, which is uh, which which is our kind of secret store, which is uh, which is going to run separately from console. However, it's going to we, we just chose to use uh, console as, as its backend, sort of like a sort of, sort of like a data store, because con so so console serves kind of two purposes here. It's it's it, we have our configuration here, um, our Hubble configuration here, and we, it also serves as a backend for Vault to keep secrets there. Um, so the way we're gonna we're gonna start this application, and the whole the whole thing is well, once the once we start the Hubble is uh, directed to you know to its mission target, which is which is some kind of nebula, and it just serves us, serves us beautiful pictures of the nebula, um, and that's that's the idea. But when we start, what happens is uh, the first thing that that will happen configuration wise, we will load our internal configuration, then we will merge it with overrides uh, from console. And then we will uh, use a token, a one-time use token, which we can use for Vault, uh, which will uh, expose an environment variable, and I'll show you that. And Vault will give us, you know, the secrets that we that we need. We'll inject inject those secrets in uh, in uh, Hazelcast in, the, in this case, and we'll we'll just roll with it. So Hazelcast, uh, the thing on the bottom, kind of yellow, yellow, orangish. Um, uh, Hazelcast is used here as just uh, some kind of data store that needs some credentials, right? That needs some secrets. That's why we chose uh, to use it here. I, I personally, I, I really love Hazelcast, and it's a it's a great product, very simple and great to work with. Um, but uh, we we uh, uh, I, I chose it for 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 the sake of having some kind of secrets that I can that I need to you know force myself to pass and and use. But basically, anything that will change, uh, we'll, we will change this configuration at runtime. So you'll see it uh, changing, and all these events, all the change events, will be written into Hazelcast. So that's what we're going to to look at. So first, uh, first, let's look at uh, CProp, which is a, a simple configuration library uh, that, uh, and we we are only going to use, you know, s s I guess the central function of, of that, but it, it, it's capable of a lot more. But we're going to use a function that's called load config, and all it does is just loads, you know, even configuration from class path file system. It just looks for certain things by default, or you can specify a certain certain path and 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 uh, then it merges, merges it with system properties, so add variables that it, that match the path, and it returns the an immutable map, right? So you could you you can ignore all other letters on the slide. Just to think about it. Loads Eden, merges it with the env, and returns an immutable map. So that's that's the gist. Um, so this is uh, just something that we can do with this. We can uh, go as crazy as we want. We can, you know parts from properties file from system props from from and we if we say you know if we, if we want to load all the environment variables or all the system props not just the one that match our configuration we'll just say you know from and from system props and so on so we can merge with custom maps and all that but but in reality you know just load config has pretty good defaults so it should cover most cases and that's what we'll use and you can go to readme to you know get a gist of what it is um and we're also going to look at, and also going to use Envoy. Envoy is this, uh, you know, a, a console, is a very minimal console client. Um, and we're going to use, we're going to use this one function. It's called Watch Path. Uh, basically, what it's going to do, it's going to take path uh, to console, and it's going to take a function to 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 run once that path is changed. So, so this is uh, kind of the console. Uh, console UI, right? We have uh, Hubble storing our storing its data on on tape. That's how historically. That's how Hubble, when it was uh, first uh, 
for in space that it, it used it used tape to store data. Then we'll change it to something more modern, and uh, you know, this will this will just trigger some function. Right. So this is just an example of how to, how, we, how we usually call it. So we'll just give it we would give it a path which is Hubble store and uh, the function. In this case, we're just going to restart certain things um, on the fly, and you can go to you know to Envoy and read more more about it. Uh, so let's let, let's look at the, the config first, so we know what, what exactly we're working with. So this is the internal config from that picture that you saw, and you can see that the the thing the the four properties on the top the, it's they, they matter the most because this is kind of the business property. So we have uh, some kind of internal server running in Hubble, we have a store which is tape by default, and we have camera which is in monochrome mode uh, because for now it's the you know, the old version of Hubble and. Uh, the first mission target that we have is Eagle Nebula, right? And then you can see we have some kind of log. So this log is uh, kind of our event log, our audit lo audit log, if you will, and uh, it's basically it's it's Hazelcast um, uh, that has host, you know, uh, some some other properties. But the interesting thing here is uh, this an interesting couple of bits here is uh, you can see that uh, group name and group passwords are not there, right? So so costs are not there. There is you need to be overridden. There's some kind of auth token that we don't know anything about yet. And uh, you know, and the and at the bottom we see vault URL. So we'll need to provide some kind of vault URL. So the, the auth token here is uh, is something that will pass before we start we're gonna start the app. And this auth token is something that we'll use uh, to go to vault and fetch creds for, for the Hazelcast. And I'll show you how that works. So we still have 10 minutes, it seems like, so we should be good on time. So first we'll load, you know, configuration from console. So this is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll create config, you know, we'll load internal config, and then we'll merge stuff from console. You're given the path, and it merges recursively, so you just give a path of Hubble, and everything else gets merged into a map. But also by default, uh, load config would override anything matching from and for, for example, that auth token that we saw before, Hubble log auth token. So if you look at the configuration, you'll see Hubble, if you follow the path, Hubble log auth token, uh, that kind of nest, nested auth token inside Hubble. So in environment variable, you can you can use, for example, double slash to get in and once well, double underscore to get in and one underscore to, to dash thing so so this variable will be merged exactly here to hubble log auth token right as we start the application so cprop will do that by default um and of course uh you know the the secret part is uh, <clears throat> uh comes from vault and uh you can see that uh we we will merge so we go out to vault give it uh, the auth token right and vault gives us back you know our credit creds and you can see that we we never merge these creds with uh, uh with the actual configuration we just uh, they're only available at the point uh, where we create the hazelcast client instance right so as we connect the instance we give it credit we give it creds at runtime but these creds are never you know exposed anywhere else they are not uh, merged with config they're not recorded anywhere just we just they're just in, tra in, in transport we went to vault get get uh, creds and then just merge them if you see hubble look uh, hazelcast so that's where we merge those creds uh, and that's how you know that's how we connect it to hazelcast securely so now it's time for a flash demo. Um, so let's, uh, and again, this demo is gonna, so we, we use cold here, which I didn't talk much about, but this is uh, just uh, something that pulls in official console and vault images and kind of uses console as a backend for vault. But we're not gonna look at this much, but we uh, we just we just pretend it's there for the sake of time, because I have seven minutes left, and uh, we'll just look at Hubble, which is, uh, you know, lives here. Um, okay, so, Cool, no, no questions. So we will go ahead and um, do you guys see the font okay? Is it tiny tears of joy? So I'll take it, I'll take it, that's good. All right, thanks. Cool, so we'll have, uh, so first thing we'll do, we'll just go, you, we did, Vault has this, uh, you know, we'll just, we'll just do this for now. We'll just, before, before doing this, we'll just do this. Vault has the script. This is this is pretty simple, right? So we, we basically curl. We're going to Vault, whatever the Vault address is, right? And we we pass we pass root token. And basically, the idea here is we're creating a temporary one-time use token for you know for Hubble secret. So here we'll have uh, 
you know, we, we have this secret Hubble audit thing where our secrets live in, in the vault, and we generate, if we generate, you know, another token is going to be different, right? So well, this token is only going to be good for, um, if, I don't know if you notice, but it's only going to be good for two minutes, right? And it's, and it's only one time use, right? So it's, some, it's just one of the things that vault, one of the models that vault can work with when getting out the secrets. So say we, you know, so we use this token. So in order for us to use this token, of course, we, you know, we export, you know, this Hubble log as, as the variable you, you remember from the, from the slides. So we export it, so now it's, you know, it's there. And now we can, we can just boot up, right? So this is a, this is a Hubble, you know, this is a Hubble root from the, from the Git, from the GitHub. If you clone it, that's, then you hear all, all you need to do is export and boot up. Um, in, another thing that I have running is, is Hazelcast, I think it's here. One second, I will check something. Yeah, so this is uh, just one thing I, I, I tested before, you know, before the presentation, I, I added one event, I changed our target to Horsehead Nebula, but uh, but this is basically a Hazelcast uh, cluster. You can see that we have three nodes, I think. All right, so we have a three node cluster and uh, it's gonna just wait for, you know, any updates that we, and our client should be connected to it. Right, so this is uh, the, our application, the way it started, right? So we, we boot it up, uh, it started everything, and then uh, here you can see that we're connecting to, you know, we're connecting to, uh, to Hazelcast, and we provide some group name and password, and it looked like we successfully connected, right? So we were able to fetch, you know, the, the membership, so we, we are one, we're connected to this three node cluster, which is great. It means that, you know, our vault, uh, our vault uh, scheme has worked successfully. And we, you know, spent some time compiling JavaScript or Clojure script to be, to, to be fair, um, compiling it into JavaScript. So now we're ready to, you know, to ready to roll. So let's go to, let's go to the browser. Let's open a new one. Okay. And uh, we should be running somewhere here. All right, so here, I don't know, I know that the, let's, let's bring console in, hold on. Okay. So, uh, so here, for example, we have, uh, you know, this is our space mission log and uh, this is a horse head nebula. So let's say we'd like to first remember, and this is our console UI, right? So in the console, we have this values, um, which are distributed across all the you know, instances. If we have more, if we had more than one, so let's say we have. If you notice, there is a tape here with storage stuff on tape, but uh, <clears throat> you know, it's 2017, and uh, we may. How about we'll you know update it to something better? Boom! So the store is updated to SSD. So we have you know things in in um, in the space log. I don't know if it's too small, but we can go into Hazelcast and see if it write a function, the written function for it. But you can see that uh, you know one thing that we did, we updated the store uh, to SSD. This is just one event that we did. So basically, we are able to successfully run our uh, successfully write our events into Hazelcast. And uh, you know, for the sake of and, and another interesting thing here, you can see that we actually uh, restarted the store. On the fly, right? So, so the idea here is that uh, that as you restart things, you don't restart. It would be strange to restart the whole Hubble, right? If you need to update the store, or for example, Horsehead Nebula is great, but I think Horsehead Nebula Nebula is a lot greater. If, you know, if you add color to it, so we'll change the camera to be color, right? So, boom, we have camera which is color. Everything's written down, and we have now we have something that's closer to modern age. And again, we can see that uh, you know we restarted with. Restarted the camera. It would be would be wouldn't, wouldn't be cool if we were just unplugging and replugging the whole Hubble telescope. So, restarting components uh, or, or parts of the system is, is really important. But th this is a kind of a mount takeaway, not exactly the configuration. But in, in this case, you can see that the configuration is also you know is also restarted on the fly and so forth. I mean, we can change the target mission, but I think you got the idea. Let's see, mission target. I don't know if I don't remember if I, if I call it get uh, uh, so if you find it I don't remember the, the exact spelling so maybe 
Maybe that's me. Let's do business. Right. So, but basically, the idea is that uh, we were starting things and uh, it works, and it's all configured. And the idea that it was pulled in from uh, console, pulled in from Vault, merged successfully to our application, and uh, now we're just, you know, now we're just showing off and playing with the Hubble telescope, and uh, without any. Um, you know, without with, with, without any any problems and any any hiccups any downtime and so forth which is which is great uh there's something else the point i want to make but uh i think we'll leave it to questions so we have we really have less than one minute so let's see if we have any questions one second i'll need to find that okay. here All right so i guess i need to say thank you first and now i'm going to see if we have any questions so let me close this. It's easier, it's gonna be easier. Close this, close this. Okay, so it looks like we, we're good. And uh, how did you choose which component to restart? Uh -huh. so, so this is uh, something I can actually go to see, <clears throat> go to Hubble project. You can see, uh, let me make it a little bigger. So here is how I, I'm adding watchers here, um, and uh, so here, for example, if you, you can uh, look a little closer to to the actual source code. So the the idea of this presentation was not you know the restarting part, but if you'd like to know about, a little more about restart, so I'm using uh, Mount Restart listeners. You can do it by hand; it doesn't have to be you know doesn't have to be uh, something built into the mount. But basically, here I say you know when this key is changed. This is some. This is what this key is re responsible for. I could, if if they didn't depend on configuration, I could. I wouldn't have to do that. I'll just, uh, you know, I'm probably name uh, give them the same name so they can restart themselves. Uh, does it answer your question? Uh, okay, so it's hard coded. Got it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be hard coded, but uh, I mean, there, there, but it just easy, it was easier for this for this demo. But I, the idea is that uh, we change something on the fly. Config, we reconfigure uh, an application on the fly, and uh, it uh, changes itself, and you know, does something for us. Doesn't have to restart things, but it just uh, reacts to our change. And uh, the front end of that uh, is uh, written in RAM, which is uh, well, I don't know if it, is it RAM. Is that the RAM? Yeah. So that's the RAM. So if you yeah, know that you that uh, you know, we have you know we have OM reagent, but uh, I think RAM is great too. And you can you can look at the the source code. I think with that, uh, I went over time a little bit, maybe like two minutes. Um, so I don't know if we, switch, if we need to switch it back to my face to say thank you, or I already said thank you and it's fine. So, yeah, I think, uh, okay. Boom, okay, so that's me again. Just one, okay, so thank you very much, guys, and uh, <clears throat> sorry, and uh, you can find me in the hallway or anywhere and uh, or on the github fire fire away with questions or suggestions great thanks a lot